Hello everyone, I am Leontine Talbo and um, for people who don't know me, I'm a digital preservation practitioner, which basically means I look after digital data in digital repositories. So think of libraries, archives, that, that type of institution. Um, and today I will be talking to something that I did in collaboration with the Digital Preservation uh, Coalition, which was funded uh, as part of my SSI fellowship, uh, which is the creation of a computational access guide. I will first give a little bit of context for everyone who's not familiar with this field and then talk a little bit about the guide. Um, but basically digital repositories, so libraries and archives um, and think of galleries or anyone who looks after digital material have been uh, present on the web since the existence of the web. Um, and early examples of this are um, uh, this, which is from the Royal Library of the Netherlands, which is the medieval eliminated manuscripts, which is basically a web page saying, hey, look at all this awesome stuff we have. Come and visit us. We've got really cool things. Um, so it was basically used as a way, the web was used at the start as a way to like promote material and like draw people into the institutions where this material was kept. Um, later on, this evolved to online catalogs, which I say a lot of you are familiar with from um, also universities having catalogs with their online material in it. Um, and it was basically a way, at the start, this was a way for institutions to, um, again, promote their material, but also um, for researchers or anyone interested in the material to go in and check what, what the institution basically had. Um, so if there was a book you were interested in, you could check and see in the catalog if it was there and then go into the reading room and actually access it. Um, later on, this, this shifted to also including digital materials. So if there was an, like a digital journal or any digital material, think of like 3D objects or digital reports from, from government bodies, um, they would also end up in the catalog. Um, and these are still the most prominent way that uh, most institutions will provide access to their material. Um, however, in say the last five to 10 years, um, a digital shift has started to happen. Um, so a lot of institutions have started realizing that the digital material that, they're, that they hold can also be accessed in a different way outside of this digital catalog. So instead of like, looking at reports or material one by one and looking for them in a keyword search function, um, people want access to this material in bulk. Um, examples of this are the Always Already Computational Project um, and the GLAM Workbench, which both showcase uh, what you can do with material if it is made available in bulk or as data, um, collections as data. Um, it's also a good example of this. Um, and basically it provides like a new audience to this material, but also showcases that there's like a different use for the material. Um, also just, so this, this kind of leads on to um, computational access. And what is computational access? So it's basically um, a type of access that institutions are able to uh, provide which makes it possible to uh, use computational methods over that material. Um, and this should not be limited to state-of-the-art projects. So a lot of people will think of AI, machine learning, all, all the more fancy uh, stuff when, when talking about this, but it can be as simple as a researcher just wanting a spreadsheet to be able to find, say, all the books that have a specific keyword or specific title in it. Um, and, um, the, the second thing that's important here is that it should be available in some digital environment or scalable. Um, so preferably through like the online public space of the internet. So it's similar to the digital catalogs. Um, I've worked in institutions in the past where people have asked for this computational access and I've been hand, I've handed over hard drives at stations like train stations. I do not recommend that it's not scalable. Um, and and like it's not very future proof either. Um, and if like granted by copyright, because a lot of this material has like certain legislation or copyright um, laws around it, it should be accessible to all. So not only researchers who are interested in it, like anyone in the public. 
Um, so yeah, so that's computational access. And that kind of brings me down to, or around to the computational access guide. So basically what you have is um, a whole bunch of people within, within my field who are interested in this, but are unsure how to go from basically a conceptual form of talking about it to doing something practical in the sense of actually providing this type of access. Um, so together with the DPC, we basically set up a guide with first steps in, in, in doing this. Um, and we did that by inviting a whole bunch of like experts on this uh, in this field and discussing with them what type of content that, that they would like to see in this guide. Um, and uh, we asked, we did like certain exercises with them. So we had like sort of memo boards that we made and um, they later helped on writing like paragraphs or suggesting case studies for the guide, um, which has now led to the guide being published over the summer. So that's great. Um, and basically it has like all these different sections to it. So there's like um, stuff that I would really like to highlight here is that we find it really uh, important to have a definition section, not only because a lot of these computational terms are used um, like interchangeably within the field. Um, it's nice to have like a good like a good overview of what, what they all mean and how they relate to each other, but also some terms are used in a slightly different context than other fields would expect them to use. So, so we thought that was really important. Um, we also highlight some different approaches to computational access. So it can be as easy as providing a data set to providing a whole platform for people to log into and like make stuff available in. So it can be, you know, it doesn't have to be fancy. Um, it, it can it can just be a data set, like that's already computational access. Um, we've got a section on ethics, because that's something um, that digital preservation practitioners are very concerned about around it. Um, and then also uh, the practical steps is, is one that I would like to highlight, which is just basically a list of stuff that you can do when considering this uh, type of access. So that's the guide. I've posted the link in the in our notes. Um, and we also, so over the summer, we basically promoted the guide and I talked about it at, at different events. Um, and we also were lucky enough to do a panel at iPress um, where we talked a little bit more about like, uh, what does it look like in institutions who may not have the resources to provide this access? Like, what would you do then? Um, which I've also put a link in the notes to, uh, which was a really fun panel session. So um, yeah, so that's me. That's my email and my Twitter, um, if anyone wants to contact me. But does anyone have any questions?